For this render, I'm going to use the uh, Release 13 physical render. If you don't have R13, then you can still follow along through the lighting, etc. But you won't be able to achieve the same um, depth of field and motion blur that I'm going to be trying to set up. Um, if we open up our render settings, at the top here for the render it's set to standard. I'm just going to set that to physical. And you can see that adds uh, a physical option here that we can open up. I'm going to leave depth of field and motion blur disabled for now and I'm going to come down and just set my sampling subdivisions to 1. I'm also going to set the blurriness subdivision to 1. In fact, let's set that to 0, shadow to 0 and ambient occlusion to 0. Um, the reason for that is just so that when I hit render, it calculates pretty quickly and renders pretty quickly. Um, this is going to be quite noisy and quite grainy and I won't recommend using these settings for a final render but I would certainly recommend using them um, for preview renders etc because your renders are going to come out much quicker and you're going to see the result much quicker and then when you're happy with it you can then bump all the settings up and then go off and do something else while your computer sits there overnight churning out the final result. For the lighting, I'm just going to use um, a few lights and I'm going to add in a background object. Normally I wouldn't render the background object as part of the scene. I'd render this out um, with an alpha and I would definitely take it into post and do some grading, etc. Um, and add in any backgrounds there. Um, it gives you a lot more flexibility. But I'm doing this um, all in Cinema 4D for those of you that don't have um, the option of using um, another application in post. Um, so let's come up and add in a background object first of all. I'm going to create a new material. I'm going to call this background. And I'm simply going to um, add in a gradient. Open up that gradient. Let's just pull this up. I'm going to make this a circular gradient. And let's fold this down and let's pick some colors. So I think uh, we could just use um, a dark blue here something like so, not too saturated, somewhere around here. And then at this end, um, again, a blue, almost um, black, just something like so. And then we drag that onto our background. And then if we render, we should have a really simple um, background just to make our jigsaw have a little bit more punch. Now, as for the puzzle front, at the moment, we simply have our image in the color channel. I'm going to switch to the illumination tab and for this I would like to make sure I'm using the Blin illumination model. Um, that's kind of an appropriate model for shiny objects. Um, let's enable the specular. And let's also enable reflection. Now in the reflection channel let's add in uh, the Fresnel shader. I'm going to reduce the brightness here down to around 6, 7, something like so and reduce uh, the Fresnel shader down as well. Um, we don't want too much reflection, but it would be quite nice if we could see the pieces almost reflecting each other. Um, in fact, let's set that a bit higher, 10, and let's set the uh, Fresnel down to about 40. And if we come up to the preview window and just make that a sphere again, we can see uh, the effect of our reflection on that kind of preview sphere. Switch to the specular channel and uh, we want that to be quite bright and narrow so that we pick up some specular on these edges as all the pieces um, fly out. So I don't want that to be too wide. I'm going to set that around 20 and I'm going to set the height quite high, about 120, so it's quite a bright white dot um, with a fall off of, say, 10, something like so. Obviously, we can uh, render this and check and tweak these as we go. Um, there would probably be a really small amount of bump on there as well, but I'm going to leave that for now. I think all the pieces are far too perfect. And if I was doing this as a commercial piece, then I would probably model them with a bit more detail and maybe have a few um, different pieces that are randomly picked and some of them have a few imperfections and things like that just to make it look um, less CG. Um, I'd like to create um, a material for the back of the puzzle as well because at the moment we have um, the puzzle front but that's going to be on the back of them in reverse and if they spin around it's going to look a bit odd because puzzles don't really have anything on the back of them so let's call this puzzle back and for this I'm going to use um, an illumination model of uh, Oranea because it's a little bit rougher and I'm going to oh, I didn't mean to change that I'm going to uh, set the roughness here to be say 100 
and you can see the the preview looks a bit rougher and a bit duller I'm going to switch to the basic tab and switch off the specular for the color channel I'm going to make this another blue color just so that we have a little bit of harmony between our front and back but just a very light pale blue like so um, and I'm going to um, add some bump as well so I'm just going to use a simple noise in here and let's set that much lower um, something like five no, four maybe and we set the global scale of the noise down to about 20 so we won't really notice that much but it just adds a sort of kind of granular texture to that take this material and drag it onto the um, cloner puzzle object now of course it's sitting to the far uh, right of the other texture tags so we um, we're going to want to take our um, image and just drag that texture tag past if we just come back to our editor camera and let's rotate around you can see that we still have our image on the back so what I'm going to do is just select this tag and come down to the side option here and if we just choose front then what should happen is we only see our image on the front now I'm not getting that preview in the editor and that's possibly because of my OpenGL settings let's just render from this view and you can see that we have our image on the front which is the result that we want let's just have a look at the back and you can see that on the back we only have our blue material so that's working um, as expected so that's cool so that means we only have the image on one side I think if I come up and enable enhanced OpenGL then it may well I oh know it doesn't work okay well that's a limitation of my system but maybe that will work for you okay uh, so we have our kind of jigsaw material or the first pass at it let's add in some lights I'm going to come up to the menu and add in a uh, target light and let's take this first light and call it key light we don't need a very complicated lighting setup but I just want to have a few lights from a few different angles so that we don't get any area that's uh, um, not illuminated and also it'd be nice to have the key light a little bit warmer and then a couple of fill lights that are perhaps a little bit cooler let's switch back to our camera view and come to a point where we have um, some pieces breaking up and that'll just give us a little bit more interest um, somewhere around there looks quite good okay so the key light is currently set to be a spotlight I'm going to set this to be an area light because it's going to give me a much wider illumination I'm also going to uh, make the color of this light a tiny little bit warmer and you can see that I'm hardly changing the color there but it's just a little bit warmer we don't really want to uh, kind of make everything orange like this um, well we could do but I think it probably um, won't work with the blue of the jigsaw but a tiny little bit warmer so that we can see a difference between our fill and our key lights um, I'm going to switch to the shadow tab and set this to be area shadows and let's make the color of our shadows um, a little bit cold so I'm going to set these to be a kind of really desaturated dark blue like so obviously we need to position this light so let's press F4 to come to our front view and um, I want the light to kind of be up here pointing down um, the lucky for us is we have a target um, and it's in the same place as our jigsaw so I'm just going to leave that where it is but I want the light to be uh, kind of much more over here perhaps up a little bit more something like so that's not looking too bad and now if we just render from this point of view um, it'll give us an idea of how our shadows are casting and how the illumination looks so you can see we're getting some shadows here they're perhaps a little bit dark but let's see what it's like once we've got some fill lights in there which should soften that up um, or, or illuminate it a little bit more as far as softening it up what we can do is we could kind of create um, a larger area shadow if we come to the details tab you can see that the area shape is currently 200 by 200 if we make our area light bigger uh, it's going to give us a softer shadow so let's set that to say 300 now we've got an S size of 600 um, now if we render uh, our shadow should be a little bit softer and there we go yeah and you can see they are looking pretty grainy but that's just because our settings are quite low so let's just leave that 
as it is for now. Take this key light and control drag to create a duplicate. Let's call this fill 01. Switch to the general tab and let's switch shadows off for this light. I'm also going to switch off specular. I don't want all my lights cast in a specular highlight in the scene. As for the color, I'm going to make this colder. So I'm going to come over and pick a sort of bluey color and it's going to be quite blue. Uh, and I'm also going to lower the intensity. I don't want all my lights to be the same brightness. I think that the key light can be 100, but the ratio between them, I want to be quite similar. I don't want something that's kind of too contrasty and moody. So I'm going to set the intensity down to 70. Um, press F2 and switch to my top view. And what I want to do with this fill light is just bring it around the other side. So it kind of illuminates all the parts that the, the key light isn't hitting. Um, so probably wants to be somewhere around here. And if we come back and render this view, that should have softened up the shadows a little bit. And you can see they're not quite so dark and harsh. They have lightened up a little. Um, and any pieces that turn in that direction are now going to have some illumination as well. And you can see this piece here is looking a little bit bluer than all the others. And the same over here. And you can see the kind of warmer light hitting the edge of this piece. Okay, I think we can safely um, duplicate that fill light and create another one. Um, and this time I'm going to pull it down and place it right underneath pointing upwards um, and just pull it this way a little bit just so that it's kind of um, going to illuminate any pieces that happen to point down um, that aren't going to get hit by um, either of the other lights. In fact, we could probably just take it over this side a tiny bit. Um, and that's going to help hit any pieces, as I say, that point down towards it. You could also add in another light um, if you wished, uh, like a, a rim light that you put up above that would be quite bright to just give all the pieces a little bit of a specular highlight along the top. Um, but I think I'm going to just leave the lighting like that for now. Fairly basic, but it should serve its purpose. Now I'm sure you can spend a bit more time setting up your lights um, and refining it and it's a good idea to um, check it from many different frames to make sure that all of your objects are illuminated nicely um, from various points in time. Another thing that I often do is to uh, switch all the lights off and enable them one by one individually just to check the illumination from each one. Um, you can see now that the fill lights I've added are definitely helping. The shadows aren't anywhere near as dark and contrasty um, and any pieces that are kind of pointing in different directions are still fairly reasonably illuminated. But hopefully we have um, a nice um, obvious key light which is creating our speculars and creating uh, these warm edges along um, the sides of our puzzle pieces as well. Um, obviously you would uh, render out some test animations to make sure that um, everything looked okay as the pieces were spinning, the specular highlights, etc. Uh, but I'm just going to leave this for now. Uh, I think that generally the, the piece is um, getting towards finished um, as far as this tutorial is concerned. Um, but what one thing I think is missing is that the whole environment is a little bit empty. Um, and again, you could add quite a lot of this in post with a grade and um, nice interesting gradients in the background, etc. But we could do with some more elements and you could um, you could certainly export your scene to After Effects and add some things in post like using something like Particular. Um, but we could also add in uh, maybe just some random jigsaw puzzle pieces that are floating around in space. Um, some that perhaps we manually animate that come a little bit nearer to the camera as we fly through. Just so that the viewer has got something to look at um, and it fills the space um, as our jigsaw um, appears a little bit later on. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to create one quick example of how we can do that. And I think that it will also help with um, depth of field and stuff like that. So if we take one of our puzzle pieces, and I'm simply going to um, create an instance of this. Um, and I'm going to add to this the puzzle back material. I don't want to um, have a front or anything to this. It's just a, a graphic device almost. With that selected, Let's um, hold down the Alt key and add in a cloner object. And let's call this cloner uh, puzzle environment so that we have um, a puzzle environment happening. And I'm going to set this to be a grid array. 
and I'm going to set the count to um, B3 by 3, but quite a few on Z, so say 6, 7, something like that. Let's say 6 for now. And for the size of it, I'm not actually sure. I'm going to just set this about 3,500, so be 2,500 on Y, and about 10,000 on Z. Switch to the coordinates tab and let's just zero that out because that's uh, not sitting in the uh, world center. Obviously we've got these uh, puzzle pieces directly in front of the camera which might pose a problem. And the other thing is that you can see that now my lighting needs adjusting because these pieces that are um, right at this end aren't getting any illumination whereas the others a bit further down are. But before I do that I'm just going to um, select the cloner, come up to MoGraph, Effectors and choose to add a random effector. Now, let's call this random environment and drag this into my effectors list just to keep everything tidy. Now, I will switch to parameter and I would like to um, create, say, a thousand on the position. Okay, and um, for scale. I'm going to set uniform scale and set that to say 0.5 so we have a bit of a difference in size of these. Rotation, let's set that to say 360 by 360 on heading and pitch so they're all kind of at different angles. And I want them to move around a little bit as well so what we can do is we can change our effector um, random mode to rather than being random to being noise. And the noise is animated so what that means is they'll move around with the noise. Now the noise um, with an animation speed of 100 is going to be pretty fast, it's going to be quite turbulent, everything moving around in a chaotic way. So I'm going to set that much lower because we don't really want to see um, too much motion in these. I'm going to set that around 5. You can also adjust the scale, which adjusts the scale of the noise um, depending on um, the size of your scene, but let's just leave that at 100 for now. Now the only other thing you might want to do here is to enable the indexed option and this just means that um, it uses a different random value for each clone because when you're using noise, um, if you don't check indexed, it uses the same random value for all the different clones and, and they will end up moving in a kind of diagonal motion as they all move in the same way. If we use index, then it interpolates those random values differently for all the different clones and you get more of a random look. Okay, so that looks pretty good. Let's um, press F5 so we can see all of our views and let's grab our lights um, and make sure that we have everything illuminated. So I want to keep the um, basic orientation and position of the lights the same in relation to the puzzle um, but I just want to make sure that uh, we're hitting all of these pieces at the front. So I'm going to just pull my key light back a little bit, maybe take it up a tiny bit more just so that we still have the same kind of illumination. And the fill light here can come right back. Um, it's still relatively, still going to hit the puzzle the same more or less, but it should hit all of these pieces too. And the fill light too. Uh, if we just come to a side view here, let's just pull this out and down so that we're going to hit all of those puzzle pieces as well. Okay, so now if we come back to our perspective view and render, hopefully everything's kind of illuminated. So that doesn't look too bad. They could perhaps be a little bit smaller. Um, let's just set my random environment parameter scale to be 1 so that we have a little bit more variation in the size. Okay, so we need to just check that uh, none of these are kind of getting in the way. These ones here seem like they might be um, getting in the way as we fly through. We don't want the camera to fly into them. Um, and if they are, then there's a couple of things we can do to sort of hide them or move them out of the way. You could also add in a few um, single puzzle pieces that you hand animate that just come close to the camera just to make it that little bit more interesting. You know, some really large foreground pieces, etc. just before our jigsaw puzzle forms. 
I'm going to come up to the create menu and just add in another null and let's just call this one lighting and uh, we can grab all of our light elements and just drop them into here we can fold that up and put it down below like so and this just helps to kind of keep your scene organized I normally have another one for scene elements which I would put things like the background object in and then depending on the complexity of the scene I would probably um, have different groups for the different elements within my scene because then I can fold everything up and I can see um, all the different sections and then I can easily um, just access lighting or effectors etc. Um, the other thing that I do is I normally would add everything to layers to keep it nicely organized there too. Okay I've just switched the xrefs back to the proxies um, and this will just mean that I can kind of scrub through and see if there's a problem with any of the pieces. See this piece here, although it looks nice, um, nice and big, kind of gets in the way. It's more of a hero than the actual jigsaw puzzle itself. And then we've got this piece here, and it looks as though it looks as though that's the only two problem pieces. So what we can do is we can simply um, apply an effector to just those pieces, um, and by doing that, we can then just get rid of them or we can move them out of the way um, and we can do that by using a MoGraph selection and what that means is we can apply an effector to that cloner but when we use the uh, MoGraph selection it will only apply that effector to the selected clones so to do this we simply select the cloner which is the cloner puzzle environment come to the MoGraph menu choose MoGraph selection and you can see now we have this red dot for uh, any unselected clones and if we then just roll over and select this clone here, for instance, and this clone here, you can see it automatically creates a MoGraph selection tag for us. If we select that tag and then come to the menu and add in an effector, and in this example, I'm just going to add in a plane effector. Under the effector tab of that effector, you can see it automatically adds in that MoGraph selection. Now you can rename these so they have a more intelligent names but this is the only one I'm going to use so I'm just going to call it MoGraph selection if we come to the parameter let's uncheck position let's enable scale uniform scale and let's just set that to minus one and that basically scales those down to nothing um, effectively hiding them and let's just call this plane environment hide and we know that that's going to be used to hide um, elements in the environment and you can see from that that the uh, MoGraph selection tag is a really handy tag to um, allow you to target specific clones with effectors and you can have more than one tag on a cloner as well simply deselect that tag and use the MoGraph selection tool again to create a different selection you can even access them through Expresso and create some pretty cool effects by kind of dynamically creating selections and things like that Okay, I'm going to come back to my render settings and I'm going to enable depth of field and also motion blur. Now we won't see any motion blur in the editor but we will see that if we render to the picture viewer and it's a good idea to leave your settings low like this um, and output the animation um, at a smaller resolution than you intend to um, output the final one just so you can get it out nice and quick and you can see that everything's working um, as you hoped and if it doesn't then it hasn't taken you all night to realize you, you made a mistake um, once you're happy with that then you can come back in and bump all those settings back up and um, and then output the final render uh, if we select the camera we can come to the physical tab um, and I'm going to enable movie camera um, and I'm going to set the shutter angle a little bit higher say 360 which is um, not very realistic um, but because we're in the virtual world we can use a 360 degree um, shutter angle that will just give me a little bit more motion blur um, but do remember that you may need to increase the number of motion subdivisions um, depending on how fast your objects are moving or you might see gaps in it um, it might not be smooth enough um, now f-stop of 8 I'm gonna set that much lower because I really want to kind of push the depth of field especially with the uh, jigsaw puzzle we don't see the pieces come very far apart and any that do come slightly in front when we're close up to it it'd be nice to see them go out of focus so I'm gonna set that at some ridiculous level um, I think probably 
1 or um, maybe even let's try 0.5 so it's a kind of uh, a really fast lens um, but we should get some uh, like crazy um, depth of field using that kind of low setting it's not that realistic um, I don't even think you can get lenses that go as low as that I know you can get some that are sub f1 but it's pretty rare um, f1 is pretty rare and I know that they're probably um, pretty expensive too um, but not to worry we're in the virtual world we can do these kind of things so now if we render um, it's going to take perhaps a little bit longer there we go and you can see that we're definitely getting um, a depth of field effect and it's actually not working in our favor because our jigsaw puzzle is um, out of focus so we need to do something about that um, and what we can do is we can actually um, switch to the details uh, sorry to the object tab um, and we can set a focus distance um, and at the moment that's set to uh, 2000 centimeters but what we can do here is we can um, actually uh, define an object so we otherwise we need to animate this um, as we got closer to our jigsaw and we basically want the jigsaw to be in focus the whole time so we can just set that as our focus object um, so we uh, just drag an object into here so simply grab the cloner puzzle and drag and drop that into there um, and now if we render we should see that our puzzle is in fact um, in focus now um, and the other pieces especially these environment pieces are, are kind of out of focus let's come back to our beginning frame and have a look at a render there we can see that some of these pieces near are kind of a little bit softer and uh, as the pieces get further away into the distance they're also um, pretty soft and if we come um, forward to a point where we're just about to go through our puzzle somewhere like so hopefully we we should get some interesting um, depth of field and you can see that we're getting some pretty crazy bright specular here so the lights might need adjusting a little bit the specular might need reducing um, we're on the proxy shape here as well so um, it's a good idea to switch to the other one because we get a much nicer bevel and it'll probably look a lot more interesting but hopefully there's food for thought um, I'm going to actually uh, come in to my render settings I'm going to save um, a QuickTime movie I'm gonna just going to go straight for a 1280 by 720 and then we can take a look at um, the final result that I achieved and hopefully you guys will achieve something um, a lot better before I do that I'm going to switch to the physical tab and I'm, um, I'm going to output a low res version first and then I'm going to come back and I'm going to set this up to say medium I'm going to set my blur in a subdivision to 2 and the shadow subdivision to 2 maybe the shadows a little bit higher um, we haven't got any ambient occlusion in here so it doesn't really matter um, we do have or do we we don't we don't have any blurriness I was thinking we had some blurriness on the reflection of the pieces which would probably be quite nice yeah let's set that to 10 this is going to slow things down a bit but if they reflect each other you're not going to get that sharp reflection you wouldn't get that in a, in a puzzle piece um, probably won't really see much of that anyway because um, everything's happening so quick and the motion blur but because of the new physical render all of these things are calculated together and it can be um, much quicker than the old renderer um, especially if you are using things like blurry effects ambient occlusion um, area shadows all of those things um, combined with motion blur and depth of field um, are extremely slow to render and but combined with the new physical render um, can be a lot quicker than the previous renderer so at this point I'm going to come up, choose save incremental and I'm then going to um, output my movie and we can take a look at that shortly. Here's the render that I've output and as you can see there is plenty of scope for improvement um, but hopefully this tutorial has given you um, some new tips and tricks that you can use in your own projects. If you want to check out some of my other tutorials then please head on over to hellolux.com. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. Thanks very much for watching.